For United fans everywhere, this is the ultimate football app for you. For match highlights, interviews and the best Man United videos and podcasts, download the free United Reds app now from the App Store and Google Play. Uh, yeah. The shout now. Well done, Bobby Charlton. Well done, Manchester United. Welcome to United Hour, your official Red Cafe podcast for all things Manchester United. I'm your host, Nick. I'm Ashwin. And I'm Reese. Yeah, we're here, three of us, ready for the coronavirus special edition. <laughs> um, it's been about uh, just over a week since our last match, which was against Lask out in Austria and behind actual closed doors. So that was our, already our first kind of glimpse in what was to come. Uh, and I think, yeah, back then we still thought the Premier League was going to have another couple of games to go yet, but uh, that obviously didn't happen. Um, Mikel Arteta got ill and then a couple of other players got ill and the whole thing was cancelled. And So we're all now in this uh, vacuum of no football at the moment. Are you guys surviving? Not really. I'm struggling already. Uh, today's <laughs> football session got cancelled. Um, and I was absolutely gutted. Um, so the missus uh, tried to make it up to me and said I could attend this podcast today. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah, because we were supposed to record yesterday, but she didn't allow you, right? <laughs> yeah, she, she was giving me the eye and like, nah, not tonight. So I thought, OK, I'll uh, give it up for one night. Give it up. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I, I managed to play on Tuesday, but yeah, my Saturday game was officially called off. So yeah, I'm not sure when I'm going to get to play again, not sure when we're going to watch anything on telly again. So yeah, I don't know. It's all a bit bizarre at the moment, really. How about over there, stateside, Ashwin? Uh, you know, just hanging out in my apartment. It's pretty fun. Um, occasionally go down to get groceries. That's about it. Uh, it's... Yeah, it's pretty much been on lockdown in New York City, so um, yeah, I don't know. It's not very exciting, and uh, yeah, I mean, all the sports are gone, so um, yeah, no basketball, no uh, no, no, no football, nothing. It's just, uh, you know, getting, uh, reading books again, forgot about that. Uh, so that's been pretty fun. I'm actually reading a book right now about uh, Mourinho's time at Madrid. So that's pretty interesting. Uh-huh. Fair enough. Yeah, good time to catch up on some of that stuff. Uh, yeah, you know, at the moment, we just don't know when it's all going to restart. I mean, they've just officially extended the kind of period till now at the end of April. Uh, I think it was quite hopeful when they initially said to the end of March. Uh, I think we kind of all knew it was going to go longer than that. And I'd probably be surprised even if we restart in May, to be honest. I mean, uh, what are you expecting, Reese? It's so tough to say. Um, I, gen- I don't think it's going to happen before end of April. Um, my estimate would be somewhere in July, um, if it is going to happen. Um, we, we can all say we think this is going to happen, that's going to happen, but... Until we don't see this crisis unfold, none of us can really say it. Um, but I do think it'll take at least a minimum of at least another two to three months uh, before we even get get anywhere in terms of thinking about when football can restart. Yeah, I mean, the only positive of this thing is watching all the Liverpool fans squirm a bit <laughs> about whether they're going to finally end this 30-year wait. And yeah, I've been having a, a lot of uh, joy with my Scouse mates and there's been lots of, you know, WhatsApp videos and memes and whatever going around about these things and, uh, yeah, making the most of that, really. I mean, I, my gut feeling is the season will get finished at some point. Um, but, yeah, watching that doubt in the Liverpool fans' mind is fun to watch at the moment, really. Yeah, I can imagine that's... Uh, I don't have that experience over here, but I'm sure for you that gives you uh, something to hold on to. 
<laughs> yeah, no, exactly. We've got to make the most of these small opportunities nowadays, right? <laughs> it was funny because the weekend um, before all the fixtures started to get cancelled, um, I was getting so many messages from my Liverpool mates saying they're planning parties, uh, celebrations, ordering cake and all, all of this stuff. And <laughs> now they're in absolute bits. Uh, Did they get refunded? Well, no, they were planning <laughs> to get the cakes and stuff, so they didn't spend any money yet. Um, but honestly, they're so gutted about it. I keep sending them screenshots of that conversation and they can't take it. Absolutely <laughs> losing their minds at the moment. And it was the perfect time to finish everything, right? Because they just got knocked out of the Champions League. We're on a great run, obviously. Yeah, I'm thankful that I managed to make that Manchester derby, which was a pretty great last uh, league game of the season for us. Uh, and yeah, you know, Liverpool have just had this kind of dodgy patch when everything gets called off, basically. Really couldn't have uh, finished at a more perfect time, really. Um, but yeah, we have to see where we go from there. I mean, there had been these other bits of news as well. I mean, uh, on the kind of personal awards things, Bruno got Premier League Player of the Month. And, uh, you know, we've already given him plenty of plaudits over the past couple of shows. But yeah, he had really been... Uh, the standout player straight out for everybody, right? So, yeah, it wasn't that much of a surprise to see him get that. And, yeah, that last performance against Lask, we'd already pretty much ready to go through there. Uh, 5-0, an outstanding goal from Igalo there and Daniel James as well, finally getting on the score sheet. And then, yeah, kind of glut of goals in those last few minutes meant that tie was already over. Um, so, yeah, as I said, we that was the only kind of slight disappointment was that we were in such a good run of form. And maybe we wanted to keep going while this was happening, yeah? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it was, it was really, it's, in, it's, I mean, it's terrible to like worry about this stuff, obviously, with everything going on. But, um, I mean, that Spurs fixture was looking great, a great time to go to, uh, to whatever the fuck the name of their place is now. Um, and, you know, but they're completely out of form. Mourinho was doing his third year thing, except in, the third month um you know i think i think ali even said after they got after they were knocked out by red bull he said in the post match that the team had no confidence they didn't like you know it was just obvious watching them they not only did they not have confidence they really had no plan or identity either going forward or defensively so it had been such an ideal time to go uh play them and really that would have been of the top sides i think that and Leicester, which would have been the last match of the season, those are the only two we had left after City because we finished Chelsea, Liverpool, and Arsenal. Um, so we did still have a match with Sheffield United, who are up there at the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I, I still, I think they would have tailed off. Um, but yeah, I mean, either way, and we finished, and we finished Wolves. So no nil nil draw to look forward to there. Uh, we could still play them again in the Europa League. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely will. Uh, yeah, but I think it was just a really unfortunate time. And, you know, obviously Bruno coming in helped, but, you know, it just seemed like not just that, we were getting healthier. So there was actually some depth in the squad, it seemed like. For God knows, I mean, we we actually had three midfielders, right, for the two pivot positions we had fred mctominay and matic whereas for most of the season we were just hoping that two of them were healthy at all times and then when they weren't we'd have Pereira slide in there and drop points um so it was just kind of lining up very well and starting to get healthy and uh you know there was obviously the potential that pogba's mysterious ankle would heal up and that you know maybe rash would be healthy for the the very end but um you know i guess the upside is that both of them should be healthy in theory whenever the season resumes but um it, it does feel like compared to let's say our competition for that you know fourth position um we may benefit the least from this break whereas i think spurs obviously have a i mean I, I, they're already what they, i think they're eight points behind chelsea so you know it's still tough for them, but um, obviously getting Kane back, getting Son back and all this stuff um, would benefit them more than I think us, where it seems like Bruno and Agallo came in and really helped solidify us exactly in the areas that we needed to be solidified. Um, and then McTominay got healthy. So that was obviously huge too. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, no, yeah, like I say, when these matches do come back, yeah, it's going to be a totally different dynamic. I mean, we were looking pretty confident into that Spurs game. I think David had been predicting a 3 0 walk in the park uh, because <laughs> they were missing Kane and uh, Son and even uh, their new signing was out as well, I think. So, yeah, yeah, it'll be a whole different dynamic now when it comes back around again, whenever it is. Um, they have, you know, they announced the other day as well that the Euros have been postponed to next year, which is apparently supposed to give time for all the national leagues to get done. I mean, that's another thing. There's a kick in the bollocks for me because I had flights, hotels, match tickets all ready to be going out to Spain and I was going to be get, watching a match or two in Bilbao of the Euros. So, yeah, that's all off now so as well. Do you get refunded for any of that? Uh, I, at the moment, I've got no idea uh, what's going to be going on. Um, I, I don't know if they'll offer refunds or say the tickets are just valid for next year. Right, right. Uh, flights, I have to wait and see, you know, it'll be nearer the time oh, yeah. whether flights are still on lockdown or if everything's still going. I mean, I'll quite happily go for a holiday to Bilbao if things have cleared up and improved by then. But yeah, at the moment, it's just, yeah, like you say, we have no idea right. how things are going to go. I mean, yeah, you know, over here in the UK, we've still been re- relatively kind of open and they've not, it's only like literally today they're announcing pubs and shops and <laughs> everything should close. Whereas, you know, the rest of Europe and all have done all these things a long time ago. Even, uh, even Donald Trump came to the census before. Yeah, no, our Canada. prime minister and scientists have had whole like different ideas that nobody else in the world seems <laughs> to agree with. But uh, <laughs> At the moment, the British boffins. Yeah, yeah. Look, I guess time will tell. But yeah, at the moment, we're still fit and healthy, at least. But yeah, schools are still being open until today as well. Uh, so yeah, now we're only just entering that phase now at the moment, and we really have no idea how long it's going to be going for. Uh, but yeah, as I say, these things one by one have all been knocked out. Um, I think they still haven't yet cancelled the Olympics, but again. I'm pretty sure it's something that is not going to be happening. Uh, They're just hopefully waiting to see what happens. I think there has been a kind of school of thought that says, oh, once the weather all starts warming up and all that, maybe it'll start pushing back against it. But we have to wait and see if that's really the way it does work out. Um, Yeah, yeah. But yeah, look, anyway... I was just going to say that the Olympics one is sheer lunacy. I don't, I just don't understand why they think that every other event under the sun is being cancelled and the Olympics of all pe- of all events is going to be the one that's going to be left standing. I mean, that needs to be called off immediately. I think it will eventually get and them just kind of opening because it's like still, I guess, three months away that maybe it's too early for them to make that call yet. But yeah, I think it's inevitable really. Uh, so yeah we'll see with there but yeah look anyway this gives us a chance to maybe have a chat about things that we don't always get time to because nowadays when we always have one two matches a week we're always so focused on what's going on and there's always transfer news and uh, you know there was something last season we did a few of these focuses on like talking about some old legendary players and things like that they're often like interesting subjects to look at so yeah I picked out uh, one of our old time listeners vault dweller on red cafe had asked us a couple of weeks ago and I kept having it on my list of topics every week to to talk about. We just never got around to it. So yeah, finally we can answer his question about, uh, you know, who was your United hero growing up and what made you pick that player? Uh, why don't we start with you, Reese? Okay. So my first memory of Manchester United was my favorite color was red. I could have been a Liverpool fan, quite frankly. Um, and I think the player that inspired yeah, because you're Midlands based, so it's not your it's not your local team, is it? No, no, um, no one in my family watched football, uh, so for uh-huh. me it was a case of just being obsessed with sports. I was like three, four. I'd play anything with a ball in it, um, mm. and watching match of the day. I think it must have been the ninety three, ninety four season uh, when I got into football, and I, it was Eric Cantona was the guy who got me into football properly. Just seeing him with the colours, the swagger, um, for me just epitomised everything that for me sport should be about. Entertainment, uh, excitement, um, you know, being rebellious. I think that's what inspired me and I think Cantona fully symbolises what Manchester United is about. And then the more I grew up watching him, 
uh, the more I wanted to be like him, he, he inspired me. I think every young kid sort of wants to be a striker when they're, when they're kind of growing up. And for me, he, he was the player that fully represented everything that I wanted to be in a, in a footballer. Um, so, yeah, it, for me, it has to be Eric, Eric Cantona, the first player that got me into watching Manchester United. Yeah, he's definitely my all-time favourite player as well. Um, I mean, I started watching a bit earlier than you, so he wasn't my first hero. But uh, Cantona, yeah, go straight to the top of my list. Every time you ever have to do these lists, for me, it's a total no-brainer that he's number one by a long, long way. And then there's a lot of choices after that. And uh, yeah, and even just, you know, off football as well. I think I just don't know if you listened, actually, you know, not always promoting rival podcasts, but yeah, the United official podcasts, there's some good ones over there. And there was one with Eric Cantona that's well worth listening to a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, even just listening to him, things like that is amazing. And uh, last year, actually, I went to an evening with the King uh, in one of these uh, kind of evening speech nights he does. And yeah, just being even in the same room as him was like an amazing experience. And uh, even though, imagine. yeah, you know, even like a lot of the stories he was telling, I'd kind of heard before, maybe here, there and everywhere, but just the kind of aura of the guy does just like absolutely stand through. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, I started watching maybe a bit earlier than you. And my very first hero was Mark Hughes. Uh, I've vaguely remembered him from his kind of first time round at United, but it was actually when he kind of came back. I think it was like 88, uh, he came back to United. And, uh, you know, a lot of younger fans probably only remember him as like a really grumpy opposition <laughs> manager. <laughs> Blackburn don't realise that he legend. was like a properly United legend, actually. Like I say, when I was younger, first started going to Old Trafford, he was definitely my first favourite. And uh, he used to score absolute worldies on like, you know, every couple of weeks, volleys, whatever. And he was one of those proper fighters on the field. And like I say, those who don't know his full history probably don't realise that he's played for Barcelona, Bayern Munich, Manchester United. And then, you know, after that, after when he left us, he went a bit down from there. Um, but yeah, he was top, top, top class in those days. As I say, for Brit players to be going out to play at places like Barcelona and Bayern Munich was not the standard thing. He didn't actually do that well when he went to La Liga. It was uh, Terry Venables who bought him from United. And um, he was supposed to link up with Gary Lineker out there and it never really happened for him. I think he was way too physical for the kind of Spanish game. And that's why it never worked out for him. But he did pretty well at Bayern Munich. And then, yeah, Fergie rescued him, brought him back to United. (laughs) And uh, he was, yeah, he was outstanding straight back from there. He was actually the first player ever to win the PFA Player of the Award twice. Did it in 1989 and 91. And that 91 season was the real pinnacle. I will always remember the two goals he scored in the Cup Winners' Cup final against Barcelona in uh, Rotterdam that won us that European Cup Winners' Cup. Uh, that was an absolute, yeah, like I say, we'd won the FA Cup the year before that. That was Fergie's first trophy. And then, yeah, Cup Winners' Cup the year after. And then, yeah, we, it was only after that that the leagues and doubles and trebles and everything came from there really so yeah Hughes was definitely my first first hero I do still actually have a Lee Sharp t-shirt in my cupboard that I wear (laughs) to play football in now and again Uh, you know before class of 92 before gigs he was like the first kind of teenage breakthrough uh, star and yeah Sharp was a favourite from mine but never quite had that kind of level of professionalism really to kind of have that longevity of a Giggs or something. And even though for years I thought he was a better player than Ryan Giggs, had a better cross, better finish. But yeah, I think he just lacked that kind of dedication to the game, which is why Giggs went on to become the much longer term player, really. Uh, But yeah, those two were my kind of heroes growing up when I first started going to Old Trafford, Hughes and Sharp for sure. And then it was Cantona and yeah, class of 92 and all came after that. What about you, Oshwin? I think, you know, you've been probably relatively later to the game, right? (laughs) Yeah, uh, later and then just kind of a different introduction uh, because, you know, for the most part, like, I didn't ever watch. The the thing is, like, for me, I was always aware that there was a whole world of football, you know, in England and Germany and all these leagues where it was obviously way better. 
So like when MLS started, I had no interest in watching it. I remember watching it for like, you know, the first few matches when I was a kid because you're just, oh, let me see. Maybe it's, and it's terrible, just fucking terrible. Um, so you stop watching it. So like really it's just every four years you'd get the World Cup. So that's like your, intro, like that's just the time you have to kind of appreciate it and then it would go away. And then, you know, maybe four years later you'd pick it up. So, um you know, I guess like if I did have heroes that got me into United, the first one would obviously be Beckham, um, just because you know he's probably the first English player to have any kind of renown and acclaim uh, over here. And I mean, a lot of that had to do with not just the fact that he was a great footballer, but also obviously his social life and who he was married to and all that. Um, also, him being very good looking helps his cause, um, kind of just drawing him to the limelight. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was always a big thing. And then I actually vaguely remember reading about how, um, what was it, how England even got into the 2002 World Cup. And like there was a huge story about that in Sports Illustrated over here and how, you know, Beckham was the the reason they qualified and all of that. So um you read that that kind of stuff and it it gets you uh into it and I I don't know if I would say he was a hero of mine. Um but he's definitely somebody that, you know, growing up I played, so like he's somebody you're aware of and um you kind of look up to, I guess, in that way. But, you know, if I was talking first proper player who i identified with and really uh appreciated it was I mean, it's definitely rooney um i think if you ask mm-hmm. any united fan over here that's around my age they would say the same um not just so much because obviously he was a great footballer in and of himself um and just a dynamic player and so creative and all that but like just the way he played i think is very um it's very physical and just like it's a very the way he played especially when he was younger was so visceral it was so like you know he didn't give a shit who he was playing against and it's just so physical the nature of how he played and i think that's like very um kind of endearing is the wrong word but it's like easier for americans who grew up with american sports i think to relate to a player like that and identify with a player like that because um you know for all of his brilliance i think so much of what made him great was just that like desire and the physicality um and all of that and you know you could see that in everything he did i think um you know even though it's kind of gotten lost with you know he had transfer requests and I don't know. I never really gave a shit about that, and I still really don't, um, because I think that ultimately, anytime he was on the pitch, he always was, you know, committed. Um, he might not be in form, and God knows his runs of bad form were just atrocious to watch. But um, you know, the fact that he had such long runs of great form in different positions and different roles, being asked to do different things, um, I'm I've always really appreciated that about him. And I think it's something that maybe doesn't get enough credit because that those transfer requests have taken some of the gloss off of his. And I, I think the end of his time at United kind of like, you know, it, it was a blemish in a way on what had been such a brilliant career. But, um, you know, there's so much there that was so great. And he really was the first player I got to watch in week in, week out, who was great. And I think who most people would consider United legend. Um, and, you know, that's just something that you appreciate. And it's like, you know, he's probably the first player really that you, that anybody over here um, kind of was able to see not just every four years, but kind of got to see him develop. Because by the time United was back challenging for titles, um, at the end of the 2000s. So like when they had, you know, obviously three straight titles and win the Champions League, um, that was kind of when we started getting more consistent league matches being shown and access to Champions League and even the Euros and all that. So you got to see Rooney more and, um, you know, that obviously helped. So more, I mean, more than Ronaldo, obviously who's, 
I think, inarguably a greater player. I always liked uh, Rooney the most. Just, uh, I don't know, something about the way he played has always really, like, kind of stuck to me. And I, I think it's admirable, I guess, in a way, um, just how much he was willing to do for the team and sacrifice and all of that. And obviously, yeah, on top of that, he was brilliant in his own right. So, um, yeah, definitely would be my personal hero. Yeah, fair enough. And yeah, interesting that the two you mentioned, Beckham and Rooney, both ended up playing out in MLS as well for a bit. Uh, nice retirement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we did have a... And yeah, Beckham's now, what, his his club has started out there, but I guess... Yeah, not yet, but yeah, they, they have a FC Miami or Inter Miami or some bullshit like that. I don't know what it is. And is he the sole owner or he's part of some... Uh, co- I think he's the sole owner. Let me check. I think he's the sole owner. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I'd seen all that was kind of starting off, but I guess it's been a bit of a false start. I think with, uh, Inter Milan are trying to sue him uh, yeah. for using the Inter. Name. There was also, like, that big rumour that... Or there was a rumour for a while before Rooney went back to Derby that he would go to Beckham's club. But I think they're trying to get, like, Kaká or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, we'll see how he gets on with that. It's a group. It's a group, but he is like the majority investor, I believe. Yeah, fair enough. No, yeah, I can kind of understand that. As you say, you probably had quite limited uh, exposure of football out there. I mean, yeah, I did actually do a year of university out in USA, and I remember it was difficult to watch <laughs> matches. It used to be like the odd Champions League game was shown, but uh, and like Premier ESPN League. too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It would be like the very difficult to watch Premier League football. Um, just, yeah, yeah, no, I remember it was an absolute just dearth of it. It's, it's really funny you say that because it would, it would just randomly, like, and I, I didn't know the schedule, right? Because it's not like at that time it was, you would even, I mean, I didn't even have the awareness to look for a schedule. But then, like, there would just randomly be a match on. I'd come home from high school and there would randomly be, like, a Champions League match on. So I'd throw it on. And it's like, you haven't seen any of these teams maybe in a year or two. So you're always trying to like, your your last memory of them is probably so different. So I remember watching like Madrid in the mid 2000s. And like, I didn't know that Madrid then was struggling, right? Like I didn't know that, or relatively anyway, for their standards. So I just remember watching them play God knows who in the Champions League. And they were just, getting destroyed and i was like this is bizarre but then during the match the announcers were like you know talking about how this is such a down period for madrid and they messed up selling makalele and all this stuff and i was like i didn't even know who the hell any of that like i had no idea who that was you know like i so like then you kind of get into it and then later you look back at that and you're like oh wow i guess that that makes sense why they were saying that at the time um but yeah i mean that's that was always like a weird thing because you know, I actually remember, I didn't watch any of it, but I remember it being reported that Liverpool had won the Champions League. What, they won in 2005, and they finished sixth in the league that year, I think. So I remember that was like a story that I had read, or, I don't know, in some publication here. And then I think they played like the the next year in the Champions League. And, it, and I didn't even know where they had finished in the league. I just knew they had won the Champions League. So my assumption of them was like, oh, they're probably this great, amazing team just like and i just watched them in the champions league I'm like they are fucking boring as hell like that was my i was like wait this is not what i expected you you know you win the champions league, you're expecting some kind of like expansive brilliant you know football and it's just completely not that so it was always weird like that you just kind of have to figure it out as you went along yeah nowadays obviously you get every game in fact you could probably watch more matches in the USA than we get over here. Yeah, I get your UK. 3 p.m. kickoffs, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, we often end up watching streams of NBC or whatever over here to watch the matches. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah the Everything coverage is goes. pretty good, though, i got to say. The coverage here is really good. Well, you actually get like a lot of English commentators nowadays, don't you? I remember as well, early days watching some of that and we like, used to roll like Alexi Lalas or something oh, like God. that. And I was like, oh, the hell is this? He's terrible. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think for the most part, so... They have like one match on Saturday and Sunday that they have their like dedicated NBCSN crew, which is the worst crew. It's it's Arlo White who's fine, but then it's like um, 
Lee Dixon, who sucks, and Graham Lassau, yeah. who sucks. Creme de la um, So that's like... I see, obviously the best are not going to be on your lot. We're, yeah. we're keeping the best ones here. But, well, uh, no, but, but for the most part, other than that, it's, I think they just hook in live to... They just get the, the, sky, the sky commentary. No, yeah, I think, yeah, your commentators, whenever I watch the US streams, they're always totally different to whoever we have commentating on the games over oh, here. Maybe. Um, yeah, it's always totally different. So, yeah, they are doing it specifically for you. And it's the same, like, if I, you know, if I am travel for work and watching be in sports in the Middle East, there's still always normally English commentators, but, again, a totally different team. So, yeah, that's uh, one of our big exports nowadays is sending them all around the world for all the different <laughs> channels. Yeah. Andy Gray on be in sports. Yeah, that's it. You go back to the old days and get keys in grey. It's like going back to the early 90s. Uh, so, yeah, retro style. Um, but now, yeah, we'll have to see now what happens because, you know, it's a big question. And when it all comes back, they're talking about behind closed doors or some people are saying it's not worth playing if the matches are behind closed doors. You know, that is a big, big question on when this because, you know, obviously it can probably happen earlier if everybody agrees to play matches behind closed doors. But there's so many ramifications of that, of like loss of match day revenue. I mean, yeah, I've paid for my season ticket this year. And then what, are the club going to reimburse me for those matches? Uh, you know, in theory, in a month's time, I'm supposed to pay for next year's season ticket already. You know, the, the club the club were very quick this year. I think within 24 hours of beating City, they sent out our season ticket renewal forms. And um, they were, I think first week of May, if in theory, we're supposed to be buying our new season tickets. But yeah, I'm assuming that's going to get delayed because at the moment, everything's so up in the air. But yeah, what do you think about playing matches behind closed doors, Reese? Or do you think it shouldn't happen until they're ready to have spectators there for everything? I don't see the point of playing behind closed doors unless it can be guaranteed that the player's safety is not at risk um i think it makes a mockery of top flight football to be honest doing it without the crowds it just defeats the purpose of the professional game um i personally would prefer they just show a bit of patience and wait until this issue is is manageable and then then, yes, maybe slowly get into a few games behind closed doors, but only when you're fairly sure that within two or three weeks of the game restarting, crowds will be allowed back in. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously for me personally, I'm not a fan of uh, football behind closed doors. But if the alternative is no football at all, then you start thinking, yeah, maybe it is an option. Um, I mean, yeah, I watched that last game, obviously, and there was a kind of very eerie kind of silence. And you could hear, you know, every time the ball was kicked, you could really clearly hear that kind of ball noise. You could hear some of the shouting between players that you can't usually hear. Some of the things <laughs> coming from the managers could be like quite clearly audible. So those are the kind of slightly bizarre things that happened there. But uh, I mean, I think they're going to have to put some kind of limit on it. And maybe if they start again behind closed doors, it's better than nothing in my kind of view. I think they they financially have to, right? That that's the big thing. Is like, I think it's easy. It, it's it's even the right thing. I think race is right. That like it's the right thing to to not play until everything is kind of cleared up and life can resume as normal. But financially, like. I don't think they can afford like as as much as hilarious as it would be for Liverpool to not win the league. I don't think reasonably they can actually not finish the season. And then also logistically, if they do that, they have to finish the season kind of by a certain point, um, so that it doesn't bleed over and affect future calendars, right? And I think I was reading that if they don't, if they cancel the season, they would be losing 725 million pounds collectively the premier league um and what in tv money yeah yeah and and you know for a club like united yes it would hit but it, obviously united has so many different revenue streams and they can they can handle a hit like that um you know better than a club like norwich and then if you kind of take that and then apply the same standard down the table like it, it's just kind of a cascading effect of it's very very hard and um i just ultimately like you know 
<laughs> as shitty as it is, money is what makes the world go round. And I think they're going to find a way to to play these matches, whether it's behind closed doors or whatever, um, because that's what matters to them at the end of the day. Like at the at the at these clubs, like you know, um, the money is relevant and. To be honest, like some of these clubs actually are really dependent on the money. You know, for United, obviously, it's very easy to say, you know, cancel the season, we can deal with it, and Liverpool and all these clubs, they can handle it. But, you know, you go down to like a club like Burnley, I doubt they, they I mean, for them, it, you know, that that's a lot harder because they need every bit of that money, not just to finance wages, but to also finance. You know, I, I think they had just built like a, a training facility, a, a new academy, and all this kind of shit. And they need all of that money to to keep that financed. And I, I think it's really hard. It's it just yeah, there's so many kind of ramifications right. and everything. It's just really difficult to work it all out. I mean, I do think they set a bit of a precedent. I mean, okay, we didn't have any Premier League games behind closed doors, but they'd already had quite a few matches in Italy, yeah. France, etc., behind closed doors, and we did have our Europa League match there. So. Even the Champions League matches, they had PSG and Dortmund play behind closed doors, and then, uh, what is it, I think Valencia and Atalanta played behind closed doors in Spain. So. Yeah, exactly. So I think that it's more than possible that it does restart like that. And I think uh, I think Liverpool and Atletico played behind closed doors, or it just sounded like it. I think maybe at the end, I don't know. Mm, I don't <laughs> think they did. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, the that's the only thing. It's a really difficult question to answer because we just don't know how long it's going to be till everything can get restarted again. Um, I I very much doubt that they will just write off the season. Uh, although I'd absolutely love it, I just <laughs> can't see that happening at all. And there's absolutely the one thing that's good is that I know there's absolutely no way they're going to just avoid Liver, uh, award Liverpool the title on default because there's no way. Because if they do that, they then have to say, "All right, so you bottom three teams are getting relegated." It opens and up the too legal, much litigation, right? Ah, that's it. The legal challenges from the teams who were there for that are just never going to happen. No chance whatsoever. So uh, either it has to be voided or it has to be finished. And it's most of the noises from most of clubs and all seem to be that they want to finish the season one way or another. Maybe things like the FA Cup will have to just be forgotten about. I don't know. There's still big question marks over Europa League, Champions League. I think I was I was reading that some of them, they were saying that maybe they would just do one-offs in, in Europe. Yeah, they were talking about various options. Yeah, playing one leg, doing a mini kind of tournament, more like a kind of World Cup style thing over a couple of weeks. Uh, I think there has been a few of these kind of ideas thrown out there that, yeah, maybe they could work. Uh, but... At the moment, there's nothing really decided because I guess everybody's just waiting to see when everything can start opening up again. I did even hear as well about how, you know, if this season kind of dragged on that it's not even going to kick off till the summer, so then it starts impacting next season, that, uh, you know, because the next World Cup is supposed to be in the winter, yeah? So it's like going to be like winter 2022. So they said that maybe they can already start like planning towards that using this kind of how everything is going to get changed so that then everything will then work out by 2022 for a kind of winter world cup. So yeah, maybe those uh, Qataris have planned this all along, right? We thought it was a Chinese virus, but <laughs> you heard it here first folks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's where your conspiracy theory is going to overdrive. The, uh, the issue with that though is like, it doesn't, it doesn't solve anything because you wouldn't want to revert to that calendar full time. Right. So that's like the that's the part of it that I, I just that part never makes sense to me that like, oh, they can push back the season and time it with that World Cup because, you know, OK, that's fine. You time it for that World Cup. But you, know, you, you have to eventually your the plan is to eventually revert, revert back to the current, you know, kind of August to what is it? Early May, I think. 
Yeah, yeah. but it was That's already going to make a total mess of the calendar for about right. two or three years after, just to which you know for me was always a completely crazy decision that I never agreed with and can't believe it was ever made to move that World Cup to just winter. Follow the money, Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, they sh- <laughs> you know they should have been forced. They they promised these air conditioned stadiums and stuff like that, and it was the basis that they were given the World Cup. And if they weren't able to deliver it, then it should have been given to somebody else. But yeah, anyway, seems like that still will happen in a couple of years' time. Um, but yeah, all this is going to have knock-on effects because yeah, if the Euros only happen in summer 21, then the World Cup is only a small window to after that. And when is the qualifying for that going to be? Uh, you know, all these things still have to be fit in. Well, even the transfer window, like because it opens July 1st, right? That's so. When it, like are you going to be able to open it July 1st if the season is if you start the season? You know, like. It's- yeah, players will be out of contract. Some players will be out of contract. Some players will be, you know, ready to move on who would have played out the season. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, there's so many, like, ramifications of it all that it's just so difficult to get your head around how it can all get cleaned up and worked out in it all. Um, but as I say, most of the noises I hear seems to be pushing towards finishing the domestic league season at least one way or another. Yeah, I, th- I think they have to. I, w- I was looking at the table. Even uh, you mentioned the relegation; like they can't just default, give Liverpool the title. But um, I think from fifteenth to nineteenth in, in the Premier League, it's four points that separate those teams. So, like y- you know what I mean? There's no way that uh, apparently there were two teams, <laughs> two London clubs that pushed for the season to be cancelled. Pretty obvious who they would be if you just look at the table, because it's it's obviously Spurs and it's obviously West Ham. Because West Ham are like two points above relegation, and Spurs would get Champions League football again. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Everybody's going to have their own vested interests to be going for. Uh, I mean, yeah, if we look at our own personal thing, then it's going to be probably yeah in our interest to finish the season. Because I'd say we've got a pretty decent chance of Champions League qualification. Uh, especially if it's going down to fifth place. Whereas if we just start again, then we're obviously not in the Champions League next season. But I think I know this question has been put out on Red Cafe saying, oh, would you happily miss out on going back in the Champions League if Liverpool don't win the league? And yeah, my answer is yes, for sure. I'll take happily take another year out of the Champions League if Liverpool didn't get that league. But uh, I do think that, like I say, I do think that the most realistic scenario is that the league season is going to be finished. Uh, when it is, who knows? Who knows? Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, why don't we go to another question that we had from Twitter uh, at Crookman on Twitter said what's your thoughts on a possible Igalo rashford combination he said I think it could be lethal with tappings galore from Marcus's passes what do you reckon on that one Reese? Um, I think it would be a very effective partnership in the latter stages of a game um, from the start of a game I think it would come down to how much Igalo can work on his fitness. Um, he doesn't seem like the sort of player who, if he started a game, he'd be able to maintain that level of intensity and hold up play throughout the 90 minutes. It seems like he's half a stone or even a stone overweight. And obviously with his age as well, I, I don't see that as a duo which would be a feasible partnership for the long term. But definitely in terms of little patches of games where we're struggling to break down a team, it could absolutely work because Rashford's weakness is his hold-up play and that's Igalo's strength. Uh, he seems to be someone who can spin a man and play someone in, which would playing to Rashford's strengths. Um, so yeah, from a tactical perspective, no reason why they wouldn't complement each other, to be honest. What do you reckon to that, Oshwin? Yeah, I think it's 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 fine. Like I the thing that we Agalo gives us options, right? Like I, I like the idea of playing him with Rashford. I like the idea of playing him with Martial, actually. I think that the type of striker he is, um he brings a lot. Like I don't want to compare him to Zlatan because obviously he's not Zlatan, right? Um, but he brings a lot of that same kind of like traditional number nine characteristics of you know, and it's a lot of the stuff that we that was lacking from Lukaku with his back, like the back to back to goal, mm. holding up the ball, bring others into play. I think Igalo is really good at that, or he has been so far at United. Um, 
No, he is great. You see straight away the ball sticks to him. He's strong, ready to lay it off. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, I knew he'd score some goals, but yeah, it's an absolute outstanding strike he had out in Austria. And then a couple of other more like proper number nine goals that he's finished over there. Yeah, yeah and I've said myself on this show that for me, I would like to see yeah, Martial out left and Igalo up front that we've not seen at all yet. Because every time Igalo's come in, he's kind of come in instead of Martial. Or, or like, I, I like that you, I think one thing we haven't seen a lot of this year is the only time we've kind of played a two up front together is with... We've seen it with Rashford and James, Martial and James, and then we've we saw it against Everton with Martial and Greenwood. And actually, I think the problem with all of that is it's it was fine. Like using Rashford and James was fine against Liverpool, right? When we played them at Old Trafford, because we were trying to play on the counter, right? So we were trying to hit the space in behind. So you didn't necessarily need that that hold up player um, or that that kind of reference point in the center. Whereas I think when we played against Everton, you could see the issue with Martial and Greenwood, where I think they both kind of tended to drift wide to get like to to find space to get the ball, and they weren't connected, right? They 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 weren't playing off each other. Whereas I think with with Igalo, he gives you that kind of reference point, and you can play him in a two, and both Martial and Rashford and even Greenwood, they're more suited to be playing kind of behind him. And and playing off of that versus um, when I think those pairings together, the ones, you know, with Rashford, Martial, and Greenwood, it's lacking a bit of that, right? And, you know, even though I think Martial's hold of play is actually very good, but he, he still tends to like to drift into that channel off the left, right? He likes to find his space there. And I think just restricting him to being a hold-up player is not his strength. Whereas with Igalo, um, you know, he is a unit and guys cannot move him. And more than that, like, he, like you know, I know he didn't finish that chance against Everton, but that's the type of chance normally we would be watching and Martial and Rashford would be five yards off. They, they wouldn't even get into that position to have the chance, right? And I think Igalo does a lot of that. Yeah, more actually than, uh, you know, balls from Rashford. There's been several balls from Wan-Bissaka and James this year yeah. that were the exact balls where you think Igalo would be on the end of those ones to finish off. Um, but yeah, no, look, I'm sure once Rashford comes back in that we'll get some chances to see some of these combos. But yeah, as I say, I think before that, I was still looking forward to see how Martial and Igalo could link up and we've not really seen it. Um, but yeah, I do agree with what you said there that and it's exactly the kind of way i'd been going but yeah there should hopefully be so many options for us then and there has been for the first time some kind of serious talk about making that igalo transfer permanent already just because everybody's seen how the guy's desperate to make this a permanent transfer you know so many stories he's going to be happy to take a massive pay cut apparently the chinese club are not going to want a huge fee something like 15, 15 million yeah, 15 has been million, talked about but yeah who knows and you kind of think at that kind of price it's well worth uh, making it permanent just for the kind of for, to have a great option from the bench really even if not i mean i still think that maybe we should be looking at somebody better to really be our number 9 uh i think it depends on what you think about greenwood really i think that's that's kind of what it boils down to because, you know, I, I would say for the most part, we all generally, and, and more importantly, I think Solskjaer obviously um, believes in Greenwood's potential to become, you know, a, a top class striker, but he isn't there yet, which is fine. He's 18. I, I think it's obvious he still needs to develop physically. Um, and right now there are definitely times where you, you feel he's better suited to playing off the off the right or you know off a striker and that's okay but I, I think what you want to be careful of is you don't want to bring in somebody who is so good that if Greenwood takes a big step next year or over in the next year or two that if you move them to the bench it becomes a problem right I think that's like if Greenwood is so good next year that Igalo has to be the fourth choice striker right among him Rashford and Greenwood he would be happy with that situation. I think it's very obvious that I got, I know a lot of times players just say what we want to hear, but in his situation, you kind of, I genuinely do 
get the sense that he like he is living his dream right now and he is happy to live that dream however he can um and it, it could you get a better player for that spot i'm sure you could 100 percent, you could is that our biggest need as a club i don't think so like i think if you can get a gallo for 15 million sign him for two or three years maybe like a, a two-year deal with another year as an option that's a that's a perfect deal for united it gives you two or three years to see how greenwood develops uh, Rashford and Martial, I think, are are good enough that um, that's fine. And you know, and if, again, if Greenwood does develop, Igalo is happy to to be come off the bench and be your, you know, your your experienced you know guy that comes in for the odd cup match and all that kind of stuff. And you know, like again, like if you so if you if you don't get Igalo, who are you going to get in Europe that? of similar cost and similar quality and all these, I don't know. I, I think you, again, you could find a better striker. No, not a similar cost. Yeah. You're not going right. to, it's going to be somebody obviously a lot more expensive. Right. And, it's, and like, obviously is that really the, assuming that we have a similar budget to what we've spent recently, which is somewhere between what, like a hundred and 150 million pound net uh, in, in the windows. Like, is that, I think if you're working on that kind of a budget, it makes way more sense to, to just go with Igalo and then worry about filling more priority positions, like getting a top class right, 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 right winger or uh, a, a defensive midfielder, and I think there are just positions that you need to have, you need to save your more significant outlay for. Yeah, fair enough, and yeah, I think everybody's kind of loves the guy immediately just because they can see how happy he is to be here. And, you know, that is a big part of the way Ole is doing things, where he's really trying to look at players' characters and how much they want to come to the club. And it's something that Fergie used to talk about a lot back in the day as well. And, you know, fans often used to get frustrated that we weren't signing certain players and things like that. And, uh, you know, Fergie used to come out and say, listen, you know, I want players who not because their agent is getting the best deal from us, that they want to come to Manchester United ahead of anybody else, regardless of the deal. And there used to be, you know, days earlier on where we weren't, we weren't paying the same money as other clubs. Uh, Players like whether they were Roy Keynes and stuff like that, they openly said, look, we were offered more money elsewhere, but we wanted to play for Manchester United. Um, And, you know, that was the reality back then. I mean, you know, maybe lately, we became the club who were throwing out the biggest deals to try and secure players. And maybe we weren't getting players whose hearts were really in Manchester United. And that was a big part of the problem and was a big part of why, you know, the wrong kind of players were ending up over here. So yeah, to see a guy like that come in and just be absolutely working his socks off just to even be happy to come in 10 minutes from the bench is yeah, exactly what you love to be seeing. And the fact that he's even then coming in and scoring goals and all that just is like really makes all the difference there. Yeah, I mean, it has to matter. Like, I think we've seen what happens when y- you don't value that. And, um, you know, like, I, I mean, the Sanchez deal was a perfect example, but there are others. Like, I mean, Pogba's a brilliant player. I don't think it's fair to say he he's just been some mercenary uh, in his time here. That That's something that gets thrown out, but I think there's a lot of different variables. But, you know, I think it's also fair to say that He's not here solely because this was his only option and he loves Manchester United so much. I think there was a lot going on there. Um, And, you know, like at times, like you said with Ferguson, I think one of the things, one of the main reasons Hazard went to Chelsea was we were unwilling to pay his agent uh, the fee at the time. That was like a big thing. And I think the same thing actually happened, funnily enough, with uh, Lucas Mora, who ended up moving to PSG. Um, But you know, like there is a a value to kind of sticking to your valuation and not de- deterring from it too much. Of course, there are extenuating circumstances, and you know it's always a negotiation. But if the if the reason the player wants to come to United is just because you're willing to give in to their demands at every level, 
that's not a good reason. That's not a good yeah, motivating factor. Yeah, I totally factor. agree with that. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many fans who are like, oh, we should just pay the money. We shouldn't be messing around, this or whatever. <laughs> and, yeah, no, I don't agree with that. Like I say, the player should be wanting to come to us ahead of anybody else. Uh, and, yeah, there's been a lot of signs that maybe Bruno Fernandes as well is in that category where he did really want to come to us ahead of maybe there was a couple of other options thrown out there at him as well. Um but yeah, you're never sure exactly what goes on in the background there. Um, I did want to just mention as well a couple of other nice stories that have been out there in these kind of depressing times. Uh, I'm sure you'd seen that Gary Neville and Ryan Giggs, uh, they've unfortunately had to close down their hotels, but they're going to be opening them up for free for nurses and kind of medical staff's use over like the next few weeks. So, yeah, great to see little things like that. The club as well themselves came out the other day and said match day staff will still get paid. Uh, I don't know if it's full pay or something. Yeah, anyway. I think it was full, I think it's full, full pay. And I think also Neville and, uh, and Giggs did that with all their hotel staff too. They're, they're still continuing to pay them time so yeah uh pretty it's funny because uh there's actually one of the owners of an nba team out here in for houston um he's laying off hotel staff actually and he's a billionaire Mm -hmm. so um it's just small things like i mean it's not even a small thing it's a very genuine act and um i think it's great that neville and Giggs are doing that and then also using the hotel for such a good purpose no, yeah, I'll say it. it's great to see these kind of stories at these times. Uh, we're trying to help these, get us through these kind of difficult periods. Uh, I think uh, somehow we have managed to nearly fill uh, an hour or so of the show over here. We have a casualty. We, we lost Reece. Yeah, I mean, we lost Reese somewhere <laughs> along the way. I hope he's not uh, come down with the virus all of a sudden and <laughs> maybe he's uh, knocked out and needs to go and get tested. Uh, hopefully it's some kind of computer problem or something. Yeah, he was, he was here at the start and uh, let's find out where he got lost. But yeah, we did have similar a few weeks ago where Colm had some kind of temporary setup and batteries ran out towards the end of the show. Um, but yeah, look, like I said, hopefully we've managed to make a worthwhile chat of it. I think we will still try and come back in a couple of weeks' time. We had a couple of other questions from people who we still haven't had a chance to answer. Uh, if people don't know, when you, if you're really missing the football on the United app and website, they're showing classic games every couple of days at the moment. They showed that absolute classic comeback against uh, Juventus in 1999 last night. I watched that start to finish and uh, it was great to see. There was quite a few things I forgot over there, like that, uh, for example, Conte was playing for Juventus that yeah. day and a few of those kind of things. is always great just to remember. Uh, Ancelotti, obviously, was in the opposition. Zidane dugout. had him. Yeah, Zidane. No, it was great to see that over there. I think there's a vote right now that it's going to be one of the FA Cup finals is the next game. And uh, I voted for the 1990 FA Cup final just because it's nostalgia value for me. But I don't think anybody else is voting for that one. (laughs) They're all going for some of the more recent options. But uh, yeah, just a nice bit of fun from the club as well to show some kind of football over there. So yeah, keep an eye on over there to get you through this kind of withdrawal symptoms of no football. I think on on YouTube, I think a lot of different channels have been posting full matches. And I I think normally... um, the Premier League and Chen and UEFA would be all over them for copyright. Uh, but it seems like with everything going on, that maybe uh, that there's a, a little bit more leash for for that to occur. So, yeah, I mean, if you're having withdrawal, check out YouTube. There's a lot on there, a lot on there. Yeah, like you say, there's plenty of good stuff to be catching up on there. I was actually just watching as well, since you mentioned him just before, there was an Ian Wright and uh, Lukaku interview that's just come out today. You can watch on, uh, he mentions a bit. Uh, he was actually kind of complimentary about Ole, whereas he's been a bit more dismissive about a lot of United related stuff in a lot of quotes he's had so far this season. But this time he was a bit more complimentary and just said that, oh, you know, we just needed a change and didn't have any problems with Ole and he actually kind of helped me in the end he to leave him. and get a fresh start. Yeah. Um, no, again, just yeah, these kind of things are worth having a look at at the moment. Uh, but as I say, look, we'll try and plug this 
gap of the no football and see what we can chat about. Look back at some old players, old matches. And uh, yeah, do hit us up on Twitter or whatever with any ideas of things you want us to cover. Like I say, in the next week or two, we'll try and come out with something else. Uh, in the meantime, as usual, do check us out on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, and give us some comments on Red Cafe. Uh, everybody out there, stay safe, uh, stay at home. And uh, look, let's hope we can all get through this difficult time together. I'm sorry, guys. Seem to have had some technical issues. Goodbye from me. Cheers. Good night. Mm-hmm.